thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I would like to talk to you about storing information. What do we do with our information and how important is it to us? And for that, let's go back a few years and think about how we used to treat information. We had books, the only information carry we had was books. We wrote things down. You can get like a few kilobytes of information in our, let's say, modern language into books. But they'll store for a long time in books. Pa paper is very patient. It'll st stick around for at least 500 years. And so in recent times, we've had demand for larger storage capacities. We had to store more things, um, had to have new devices in storing them, tape, CDs, hard disks, or memory disks, um, drives. So we got this capacity, but what we lost during that time is storage stability. So these devices, even if you perhaps think your data is safe where you've stored it, they're not designed to store information for a long time. So let's just quickly try to find out how much information was generated here. Who, who made a picture from his cell phone today? Probably yeah, half, I would say. So let's say a few hundred pictures, five megabytes each, generated for memory, for sharing experience, and lost in a few years. And so what I want to talk about is um, how important is information to us, and if it's important to us, then we should uh, really take care of this uh, information. And somehow it's a problem of our times, somehow, if you look at these examples, that things are not made for long durability. If you go a few hundred years back, in Switzerland they had these cupboards, um, they are indestructible. We still have them at home. If you move, they are really a pain because they are a few hundred kilos. Um, but they were built to maintain their function for a long time. Watches, Swiss watches, the same, few hundred years old. They will still run today. If we take today's products, we buy a cupboard from Ikea. If we try to move them twice, it's probably end of their life. Um, <laughs> this uh, watch from an American producer is also not designed to be stable for a long time. They make money by it breaking down and you have to buy a new, next version, better uh, version of that. So in information, we have the same. In the past, we had people really taking care of information. Monks, this is a, from an abbey in Switzerland, in St. Gallen. If you're ever in Switzerland, please visit it. It's an amazing place, architectural, all these old books. Some of them are over a thousand years old and they somehow carry our history, our heritage, or what at least what we see as our heritage, because that's the only information we have um, from that time. And there were monks, they dedicated their whole life in copying books. So there was really these traditions of, let's say, copying books and distributing them to other abbeys to distribute this uh, knowledge of the time. We can't do that anymore, because the information we have is unimaginably large. There's this uh, science project, uh, this artistic project, trying to show how big Wikipedia is, printing just a few most important articles uh, on paper, and you see what enormous amounts of paper that you uses. And that's just Wikipedia. We have so much other information, and we have to we have to store it. And so the question is, how can we store a lot of information for a long time? And the best way to look at that is to look back and have a look, well, what information do we have from the past? Where do we get very old information in very large amounts? And then we get to this bone, um, which is 700,000 years old. And it's the bone of a horse which died somewhere in Alaska or near Alaska, was frozen there. And 700,000 times later, scientists could extract the DNA from this part cut out and read back the genome of that horse that had died a few hundred thousand years ago. I think that's really amazing. This long time period and the amount of information that's been transported to us in that way is about a gigabyte of information. So that's already a lot more than the, 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 the heap of paper that we showed, I showed you on the, on, the, on the previous slide. So DNA is somehow interesting in storing information. It can preserve for a long time and it has a very whole large uh, density. 
Just give you a little more background on DNA, what it is and what it, how it works. In every cell of our body, we store a whole genome in DNA that's a, a long molecules, a few meters long. It carries about a gigabyte of really f information that defines everything we are. And we have about 30 trillion cells in our body. So you can somehow imagine how much, let's say, information that is. That is a little boring information because all of our cells are equal, or more or less equal. So it's not that we have this one gigabyte of information 30 trillion times, but just the amount of information that's there, I think you can somehow think of as a really large um, amount of information. Let me just show you very quickly how it works or how it stores information. So DNA is a molecule, a long strand of a molecule, and it has like these steps. And in these steps, we have uh, four different possibilities, uh, cytosine, guanine, and so on, which by varying these steps, we can generate a variety, which is information. So I'll have a different sequence of these molecules than you, and your neighbor will have again a different sequence of those molecules. So that's really how we are defined in this information stored in this really fascinating uh, molecule. Somehow it's like computers. And the nice thing also about how computers store information are zero and one. Uh, it's just DNA stores information, a sequence of these, let's say, four different possibilities of this in this ladder, and digital information we store as zero and one. And what I like about this is that this uh, way of storing digital information was developed before we knew how DNA does it, how nature has done it forever as a sequence of these possibilities. And I think that's a very nice way. D nature still does it much better, has four possibilities. We usually only take two in uh, storing information. So I think you can imagine that you can somehow translate these zeros and ones to uh, A, C, T, and G. You make up some kind of a rule, you write a computer program that says zero is A or T, and you can make up your own rules. So we made up some kind of a rule set how to translate that I won't go into the details of that. But the interesting thing from a chemical point of view, that we not only have DNA in our body in, let's say, this sequence, we can also synthesize that sequence at will. So we can go to a lab and say, well, I want to have DNA with a sequence A, C, C, T, C, T, C, G, and so on, and they will synthesize it for me. And to give you an, another idea how dense that information is or how much information is hidden in there, this perhaps, for me as well, unimaginable number of one molecule where it's 10 to the minus 21 grams. That's not very, um, let's say, tangible. But if I tell you, well, I have a grain of salt, a material which has the grain of salt, as size is the grain of salt that is DNA. In there, I will store 6,000 terabytes of information. So a modern hard drive is about a terabyte, so it's 6,000 hard disks stored in, let's say, one grain of salt. And somebody took away my salt mill. Um, in, if you have a salt mill, there's perhaps a million salt grains in there. So a million times 6,000 terabytes. To give you an idea how much information we can really pack into this, this molecular way of storing information. So that's the synthesis, I won't go into the detail. We can also read information, and that's something that has changed dramatically over the last few uh, years, where there was the Human Genome Project, where it was the first attempt to read the whole genome of uh, our body. That costed uh, about $100 million to read it once. Nowadays, just a few years later, let's say 15 years later, you can have your genome read for $1,000. So a dramatic change, a change in, let's say, technical development that is much faster than the well-known Moore's law, Moore's law known from uh, IT world, which was the speed on um, how uh, processor speed um, increases. So we can read and write DNA, and it's amazingly how much information you can pack in it. But the problem at the beginning, I told you, well, we're looking at stability and we had this bone and it was really stable. But if we look caref more careful, we find out that DNA is not so stable. In our body, 
We have many, many errors that happen all of the time with our DNA, and we have very complicated error correction mechanisms which correct for that in the living system. If I have, a, let's say, a non-living system, just DNA, it can't correct. And as such, DNA, if I have it in an environment, if I put it on the table, it'll disappear, it'll disintegrate in about a, a year's time. So we have to do something to about that stability. And the question in doing that is, what's the difference between DNA on the table and the piece of bone? And the solution to that comes from a movie. I hope you all know that movie, uh, Jurassic Park. Um, where you have this fossil, and in this fossil you have a mosquito, and in that movie they uh, take the blood out of the mosquito and take the DNA out of the mosquito. That's all not true, you can't do that. There's no DNA in mosquitoes. Uh, there's DNA in mosquitoes, but not mosquitoes in amber, uh, because uh, mosquitoes in amber are much too old. They're, they're really, really 100 million years old, and there's nothing in there, just a skeleton of the mosquito. But the idea is correct. Things are better stored if they're kind of encapsulated in this, in this shell in amber. So we said, well, we'll take DNA and we'll make a synthetic shell around it. We'll protect it from the environment. And so what we developed is what we call a synthetic fossil, with something where we take this idea of encapsulation, we take DNA molecules and we build glass around them. So you get these uh, small particles I have here. They're about 100 nanometers large and they have DNA molecules in them. You don't see them. I'm sorry, we can't visualize DNA, so I have to take this picture and tell you, well, there's DNA inside there. You just have to believe me um, that, that that's the case. But what I can show you is that the DNA in there is really stable. This is the stability of DNA in water. So you can say at 20 degrees, it'll survive perhaps a year or so, DNA in water. And if I take DNA and put it into my glass, or into bone, or if I have it in natural bone, I get this dramatically increase in stability of the DNA. So at 20 degrees, I get a few hundred years um, of stability, a little more, between 100 and 1,000 years of stability um, of that molecule. Very similar to the stability we know that DNA has in those ancient bones. The ancient bones stored much longer because they were stored really cold in somewhere near Alaska. Where we already heard today it's uh, really cold. Um, and we cannot only use this technology to store uh, synthetic DNA. We, for example, developed a product or project uh, with uh, jewelers in Sweden and Germany where we take uh, the DNA of the couple and we encapsulate it to preserve it and then put it into the ring. Um, and a nice story fitting to your talk very nicely um, on uh, experience. When we talked to the jeweler, he said, world's so bad. People don't spend money on rings anymore. They spend all of the money on making a nice party. How stupid is that? <laughs> um, so we see here that we can, let's say, generate additional value into, into such a product. Let's get back to information. I'm a, let's say, experimental scientist. So I don't just want to tell you a story. I want to be able to really do that. So we took, had the idea, we'll take some information. We, oh, sorry, that was a little fast. Uh, let's hope it goes back. No. Yes. So we take some information and we translate it to DNA. Um, we we'll have it synthesized and we encapsulate it. And if you do something like that, you have the nice opportunity. You can choose what information do I want to store. Which information do I think is, is, is useful or valuable? And there are endless examples. We, because we work in Switzerland, we took the Swiss Federal Carter, which is this piece of paper from 1291, and every Swiss school child, you will ask, what's the basis of uh, the Swiss state? He'll say, it's that piece of paper. So there's real value in that piece of paper. There's cultural or, let's say, political value in that very old piece of paper. The other book is also very interesting, and that has its own interesting story. It's the Archimedes Palimpsest, is a book original written by Archimedes. It's a basis of some of the mathematical tools we have today, and it's the only copy of that book, copied by monks uh, more than a thousand years ago, and that's, that's more or less the second text we, we chose to, to store. So we took those two information, we um, have the DNA synthesized, we put it into our, let's say, fossil encapsulates, 
And then we have to simulate storage because we didn't want to wait for a thousand years to find out if our technology really works. So we simulate storage by increasing temperature so the K is faster and then we can calculate back what the stability is. We release the DNA, we read it back and we decode and then we check if the information stored is the information uh, we originally put in. And by the bit, the information we stored was the information we got back. Even after severe, let's say, thermal decay or let's say the lifetime that the information went through simulated for various temperatures. So colder is better. So in our case, if you go to room temperature, we'll get about a thousand years of stability of this information stored in that way. If you go to a really cold point, minus 18, we get a million years of stability of that information. Minus 18 is chosen because there's this uh, global seed vault. Somewhere in Spitzbergen, there's this vault at minus 18 where all the natural heritage of our world is stored as seeds. Fake old, so if anything happens outside of the world, we can go back and take out the seed and let's say plant the tree again. And what I think is interesting is that we do that for let's say our natural heritage, but we don't really do that for our cultural heritage or certainly not in this very advanced technical way, we don't, uh, we don't do that. And I think that's something we should be thinking about doing. I would put it to the Jungfrau Joch, which is a very nice cold place in Switzerland, accessible by train. Also, if you ever go to Switzerland, it's a very nice uh, uh, place to visit. I would build like this eternal library where we store information that's important to us, to our culture, and make sure that it'll stay there for a very long time, so really, really for our future. Now, if you do that, the question is, well, what do you store? Who decides what's important to us? And I think there are two solutions to that. You either go to the UNESCO, which has people who have previously asked themselves the question, what's important? And there's, like, say, this memory of the world, important documents of our culture stored. I think there's a much better, much more democratic way of deciding what's important or which information is important to us, which is through Wikipedia. Wikipedia is, I really see, as an image of the information we have. There's very long articles on Justin Bieber because people today are interested in Justin Bieber. And I think that's something interesting or important to be transported to the future if we want that the future understands our time or can interpret or learn from our time into interpreting in, in, in their own world. Now, one important thing I have to tell you, I'm a scientist, this is still future. We can store information in DNA, we can store a few books, it's still relatively expensive. And so the second and much more important message to you is, um, what information do you have and how valuable is it to you? Um, this is a, a wedding picture of my grandparents in silver print, so I see it, of my grandparents, uh, perhaps a hundred years back, not quite. Um, this is my wedding picture um, made on a digital camera. The chance that my kids will ever see this picture is really, really low, unless I go and print it and take additional measures to store that um, that information in the right way. So my really, let's say, non-creative and boring message to you, take care of your data, select which data is important to you and really take your own measures in maintaining that you can keep it, store it on tape, on disks, on microfilm. Perhaps in 10 years you will be storing it on DNA, but today you have to take measures and uh, store that information. We as scientists, we also not only look at the future, we also have to look at what, what can that DNA technology do to us today. If it's still expensive in writing a lot of information, well, isn't it interesting to have a little information in a small particle? Because we can use that, have put it into a particle, uh, it's anyway already a particle, and use that particles as tracers for goods or products. We want to put some information into the product, not gigabytes of information, just a barcode, just a few bits saying, well, this product was made here in the Netherlands um, for, and another product somewhere else because the different value of where the product comes from, of what story comes with the product. So you can develop like a product paternity test 
where you add information by DNA into the product. And throughout the whole life cycle of the product, you can read, let's say, the history or where that, where that product really came from. And hopefully, if we build on small amounts of information and increase that and increase that, we can really get to this future of storing digital information exactly the same way as, let's say, biological information is stored in our body. Thank you very much.